Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you all for the invitation as well. Um, let me say a quick, quick few words, words before I start um, where I moved recently. Currently working at IMEC. IMEC is a um, world leading R&D lab for nanoelectronics and digital technologies. It's uh, quite big. It's in Leuven at the university, close university. It was a spin-off of this university 35 years ago. And by now, there's about 4,000 researchers working there. Uh, almost 100 different nationalities. We have research groups affiliated to basically every Flemish university. And then we have a lot of sites over Europe, quite a few in the US and quite a few in Asia. So basically, we work together with all the big electronics companies and we build new technology for all the CPUs that sit in your laptops and in your uh, mobile phones, also for the memory. But that's not all that iMac does. iMac has a full list of all kinds of things. We work on photovoltaics, power switches, life sciences, artificial intelligence. But what we are mostly uh, working on is the CMOS part, basically the memory and CPUs that, that we use everywhere. So all of that is coupled with a lot of, of infrastructure. We have some very advanced clean booms where we bake wafers, make new uh, uh, samples. And then there is a very large set of spectroscopy materials. And very interesting is also the new Atolab that we are building where we will be doing pump probe spectroscopy using up to, 200, uh, up to 124 electron volt beams, 20 to 20 attoseconds to 200 picocent second uh, pump probe um, type experiments. So here I'm working now. Um, most of the work I've been doing before, but I'm going to talk about was from before of this. And basically we will be talking about GW, right? And we have the big advantage of, of these nice two talks just in front of me, so you all understand exactly what is GW about. Ooh, there's a lot of question marks still, right? So I'll just keep keep the, the theory slides in there as well. So let me start with with my little historical perspective on GW, right? So GW is quite old already. 1964, he didn't wrote down the equations. Then it took about 15, 25, of 20 years before the first actual calculations were done. <coughs> first on some very small systems, silicon, diamond. And then it took another 20 years for GW to come available in actual codes that people could use. There was a binet, and then afterwards there's the FASP code. And at that point also people started working on molecules, finite size systems, lower dimensional systems. And then it took another 10 years and then there was a paper that called predictive GW calculations. So apparently everything before this paper was not predictive. So actually only like this much of a time later people start to wonder about what is the accuracy, what is the precision actually of GW. So there's this famous uh, statement about solid state theory that everything works for silicon. And this is basically true, right? I've made a lot of pseudopotentials and you can make a pseudopotential completely full of crap and it works for silicon. You just get the right lattice constant for silicon. Same goes for, for GW. You can do GW any approximation, any crappy or very good uh, plus one pole model, whatever. Doesn't matter, it will work for silicon. Right? Which means not that everything that works for silicon works for everything else, right? So if you go away from silicon, everything breaks down. Okay, so now at that point we thought this is maybe a little bit of a problem. We started to do this GW100 set, um, at least for small systems we did a big review. And I will be talking a bit about this, hopefully answering also quite a few of the questions that we have seen last of the lectures. And now finally at this point we arrived it's almost being published, a paper where we do a systematic, well, it's not a benchmark. It's not even precision and accuracy, it's just reproducibility. Making sure that at least if we see three different codes, we try to do exactly the same thing. Same basis set, same set of potential, same ground state DFT calculation, same type of GW. Do we actually manage to get the same result from GW? Right? All of this is very important, right? If we want to go to high throughput, we need to know that we are doing some right. So this is 
what I would like to call the GW propaganda slide, right? So, first time this, this, this picture was shown, 1959, the world was perfect, right? GW solved all the problems in the world, perfect agreement with experiment. Then about 10 years later, the agreement with experiment wasn't that perfect anymore, so there's a certain time dependence in GW apparently. Um, but obviously, this, this was not a problem, we just go partially self-consistent, and then the agreement with the with experiment again is perfect, but that was not the right kind of self-consistent. You actually need to do something like partial quasi-particle self-consistent. So complexity started to build up and build up and build up, and, and we have like a comparison with experiments where only like a handful of systems were looked at. So that was basically prompting the question. So how precise are all these results, right? Precise means the numerical precision of your calculation, all the numerical approximations that you make, the finite sizes of the grids, the finite sizes of integration grids, k points, whatever happens. <coughs> then there is a question of self-consistency, right? G not W not, which starting point, which level of self-consistency, um, what kind of GW integration method, we'll get to that, right? Um, what to compare to, which basis set, plane waves, local orbitals, do we get the same? What's better? What core valence partition? What kind of pseudopotentials? And this is not just a glitch, right? The list just goes on. I didn't want to show all of it. Uh, maybe we don't care, right? We just converge and we just tune our parameters until we kind of hit the experimental value and we say, good result. Um, Maybe it's also just a very hard problem, right? Uh, it's only a few, few years ago that we actually managed with a very large group of people to benchmark DFT. And this is not a very complicated benchmark. This is just elemental solids, just calculating basically the lattice parameter of the elemental ground state of the elemental solids. So if this was such a big effort, maybe GW may be very much of a challenge. And that's why we basically decided to step one step back and go for, for molecules, because that's slightly, slightly easier. So let me just, just to remember you again of the two previous lectures, run through the formalism again. And this is basically where I usually start. It'll say, look, in Koncham, we know what we're doing, right? We have a density, and the density of electrons is parameterized by our Koncham uh, orbitals, and we have an equation which basically couples this density to an exchange correlation potential, Hartree potential, and then we get our Koncham orbitals and our Koncham energies. If you write down GW in the same way, it's not that different, right? So instead of a density, we now have a Green's function. The Green's function is uh, parameterized or de decomposed into uh, quasi-particle orbitals. It's a bit more complicated, and there's a sum over all states, but it looks a bit similar, and now we have this new equation, which is the quasi-particle equation. Again, so quasi-particle orbitals, quasi-particle energies, you see a bit of, a lot of, lot of agreement between these. Now, problem here is the self-energy. So we replace this local Koncham exchange correlation potential by a non-local, non-Hermitian energy dependent self-energy, right? But if we have that, we can in all kinds of approximations now calculate the corrections to the energies. This one we saw before, right? Now, now we understand this. Big advantage in contrast to the Koncham is that instead of a vague unknown exchange correlation functional, we have a set of equations that we can use to generate systematically approximations for the self-energy. That's what we do. We cross out the complicated term in the vertex function and everything simplifies to four coupled equations which give us the GW approximation for the cell energy, right? Okay. So now, that's where all the misery, or a lot of the misery starts from. This thing needs to be calculated, right? So we need to calculate W, so that's the screened Coulomb potential, and we have to convolute it with the Green's function. And now there is like 500 different ways of doing this, right? We haven't seen a lot of them yet. First one I would like to introduce to you is the exact analytic approach. You can do this for molecules. 
for solids, this is a bit more complicated, right? So what we actually do is we calculate the exact spectral representation for W. We have the spectral representation for G, and now all of a sudden this complicated integral just becomes a sum. Do a bit of uh, complex uh, function theory, and then this just becomes a sum, and we have an explicit approximation. Well, not an approximation anymore. It's just the only approximation that sits there is the approximation of the finiteness of the basis set. So then there is analytic continuation, plasmon pole, multipole expansion of plasmon poles. Analytic continuation basically means that we do this integration not on the real axis, but on the imaginary axis. Again, a bit of uh, complex function theory, and we get to a sum and an easy integral. Finally, there is... Um, Let's go here. So this is the fully analytic approach. This is the, the, the sum that I was talking about. The advantage is that it's exact, except for the basis. Um, and it has the fully analytic structure, but it is very expensive, right? But we can do this also for relatively large systems. Analytic continuation, we do the integral on the real axis, on the imaginary axis, and expand it on the real axis to get the self-energy again on the real axis again. Then we have a plasmon pole. It's been discussed quite, quite extensively already. And finally, contour deformation, which is another way. So instead of doing the uh, first the expansion to the, uh, the integral here and then do the expansion, we first do the, uh, the integral in such a way that, again, the, the sum changes, of the integral changes into a sum and a part of an integral. This can be made exact. It allows for more complicated self-energies, but the problem here is that it introduces, again, a lot of integration parameters. And if we want to go high throughput, if we want to go automatic, that's another problem because it's another thing we need to test for. So, now, for benchmarking GW. So we started with, with molecules, and in the first project, there were three, three groups involved. In the end, we had five different ways to evaluate the self-energy. And we had, after a project of about four years, managed to get very well converged ionization potentials and electron affinities. That was the state of affairs at that point. This is the state of affairs at present time. There were a couple of cluster calculations done for these molecules, blame river results by FASP and by WEST, CP2K results, that's a uh, local orbital code with a plane wave expansion for the density. Stochastic GW is running, situated the set right now. Uh, Mol GW ran it, Fiesta, Abinit, Yambo is also currently preparing to start participating in this project. And now in total we have uh, even more ways of doing the self-energy. There will be even one more when, when Yambo joins. Then there were also other groups that didn't do GW calculations, but other kinds of ways to calculate ionization potentials that also took up this set. And by now, the total number of data sets is closing in on close to 100 sets. At some point, we will write another paper. So this is the current situation. We have a website where all the data is present. Um, at the moment, it's down because I'm writing a new paper, and there's too much new, fresh data to have everything <laughs> online at the moment, but soon it will be back. Um, and there's all kinds of tools to make comparisons between one set, the other set, or a subset of sets, and I will show you quite a few of those right now to see where we actually are and what we can learn from all of this. So this is a little bit of an uh, overview of the molecules, just to have a quick shot here. That's what's included in GW100. So it's not just your standard chemical hydrocarbons, but we try to be as complicated as possible. Nasty, very ionic systems, uh, other ionic hydrides, other types of things. Maybe chemists would not even call them molecules, but if you put these two atoms next to each other, they form a perfectly nice bonded dimer. Um, and these are the atoms that are present in GW100. Obviously, there's some big holes here. On top here, there's a big hole. Um, also, the transition metals, uh, that's, that's still not very well uh, presented. Um, we're actually working on that. So, with a bit of luck, in a couple of years, we will have extension of the GW100 set for transition metals. So, 
I'm going to show you a lot of plots that look like this. And this is what's called the violin plot. It shows you a kernel density of the distribution of a large data set. So I'm going to do GW calculations, not for one system, but for all 100 molecules, and I compare them to the results of another code. So I have 50 different results for the homo, so I can do 50 times 50 different of these combinations, right? But I won't show all of those, but just to give you an idea. In the middle, there's just a standard box plot. The little white dot gives you the median value of the distribution. This is the 25% and the 25% edge, so 50% of the systems sit in this, and this is just what is called the whisker, uh, and outside of this point, there are statistical outliers. Just to have a quick visualization of when I compare two big data sets to each other to get a result. So the first thing to do is reproducibility. Basically, when I do the same thing with two different codes, do I get the same results? So we have two codes now that can do this fully analytic approach, analytic discretion of W, convolution with G in an analytic way, and then just make the big sum, and you see we get a very nice agreement. So 80% of the molecules are indistinguishably uh, same homo energies. There's a few outliers, uh, but we basically know what's, what's happening here. These are very complicated systems, and you see this is my favorite system. So if you want to calculate one molecule, try to calculate beryllium oxide dimer. We'll give you the most problems. Okay, so then next bit of, of reproducibility, let's take all the codes that can run local orbitals, and we do quadruple zeta with polarization basis set, exact same basis functions, and we look at different ways of doing GW, try to push them all as good as possible, and you see actually large set of the molecules agree very well. You see this box plot in the middle is almost shrunk to zero. So 50% of the molecules are all sitting inside that little box, and there's only some outliers putting outside. So you can, these two codes basically do exactly the same. That's the, the comparison you showed before. New implementation of the analytic continuation in Fiesta is also doing very well at this point. So there's only one outlier here and a few on this side, but not much more. Um, if we do the PADE con analytic continuation with AIMS and manually check all the molecules for convergence, we get very close. And if we do a 128 uh, uh, PADE approximation in, uh, in CP2K, not explicitly testing convergence for every molecule, there is still also a very decent uh, agreement. So, what about this PADE approximation? You see, I showed you already these two results. If you just use a 12-pole PADE approximation for the analytic continuation, already there's uh, the box plot starts to increase, so a significant amount of the molecules start to not agree that super well anymore. And if you just take a two-pole approximation for molecules, right, then the distribution really gets off, and we also see a sliding off of the of the center. Now, part of the of the outliers of the cases where people did not yet exactly manually check exactly what's going on are coming from your Dyson equation solver or your quasi-particle equation solver picking up the wrong solution. So we usually discuss the solved quasi-particle equation. So we have the Cohn-Sham orbital sandwiching self-energy and the exchange correlation potential. But this one, self-energy, is evaluated at the quasi-particle energy. So this is already an equation that needs to be solved self-consistently, right? Graphically, this means that I can collect all the linear and constant terms in the red line, and then the correlation part of the self-energy that sits in there is like this nasty function. And obviously, if this intersection, this first intersection, is very close to one of those poles, you can easily have a solver that accidentally hops to the other side and then converges to the other solution. So that's something you need to take care of, but we know now what to do. An important thing that you can do here is just check the slope at the solution that you found. If it's larger than one half, usually you are in a dangerous region. So, next step is precision. Remember, this is about what is the error in my final result due to numerical and mathematical approximation. So I'm not talking about basis sets here. 
well, maybe a bit about base sets. That's on, on the cross, right? And I'm not talking about what kind of self-consistency. I just decide I'm going to do this kind of GW with this exchange correlation function as a starting point. What is the effect of my, uh, my decisions? So first thing to look at is basis sets. And in general, when we start, want to compare local orbital codes and plane wave codes, we need to do a basis set extra extrapolation for both to make sure that we actually compare the right thing. Right? I cannot do a quadruple zeta basis set with a plane wave because that's something completely different, right? So for the local orbital codes, we use standard type of um, basis set expansion. Let's, let's skip the details, but you can see there's different ways of doing this for different types of basis functions, and we do get to the same extrapolated results. Now, if I look at these local orbital basis sets, this is basically the error that I introduce with a basis set, with a finite basis set. So this is a split valence basis set with polarization. Usually, this already gives you a very good initial guess for your DFT calculations. This is generally good enough. Ground state calculations are usually very good at triple zeta. With DFT calculations only, the error in DFT is usually larger than the error that you introduce with a triple zeta basis set. So never think about going beyond triple zeta for just Concham calculations. But you can see for the GW result, this is about 0.4 electron volts off on average for my homo energies. And still the quadruple zeta is still on average 0.1 electron volt off of the extrapolated value. So these are just numbers to keep in mind, right? And it also means we have to do this extrapolation if we want to co compare it to um, plane wave results. Now, we also do plane wave results, and both WEST and VASP implemented convergence uh, algorithms to test and to kind of extrapolate the results to an infinite basis set limit for the plane waves. And the nice thing here is that we see that the center point of these distributions now all align. And that's what we generally see if there is an issue with the basis set converging, we see that the entire distribution is shifted off. So between Ames and Turbomo, we see a very nice uh, agreement. So this is both extrapolated data. And for the two plane wave codes, we start to see at least the material is close together. And 50% of the systems fall within 0.1 electron volt if we do the extrapolation. So that's a uh, sort of confirmation that if we do the extrapolation correctly, we get the same results between local orbital codes and plane wave codes. Now, if we, once we have this under control, we can start to compare the different ways of GW. So here we compare plasmon pole uh, model. This is the Hubbard and Louis plasmon pole model. This is a numerical full frequency integration on the real axis. It is extremely expensive and uh, not so good, actually. Um, these are, again, the results you showed on, I showed on the previous graph, the extrapolated plane wave results. Now, why is this one shifted to the right? Because this is not basis set extrapolated. Right? This one is also not basis set extrapolated, so assuming that the same shift would be here, this entire thing would shift also the same way there. So, Main conclusion here is that a plasma pole module for something with a complicated dielectric function as a molecule is not a very good thing. So now we can collect all of this for, uh, for many codes. Uh, let's skip through this because I have a lot of other things to do. We'll just keep this slide that gives you some numbers. You can look it up later, right? So now, we get to the interesting part, right? A lot of people already asked, what about starting points? Someone just called GW parameter free. Well, obviously, you have to keep, pick a starting point and you have to decide how many levels of self-consistency so you implement. So in principle, the fully self-consistent one is parameter free, but everything before you get there still depends on what you decide to do, right? So this gives an overview of what happens if I change the amount of exact exchange in the starting point. And I compare to coupled cluster, total energy differences, singles, doubles, and perturbative triples. And I see that there is a kind of a linear monotonous behavior. So if I do G dot W naught on top of Hartree Fock, I overestimate my homo energies if I do 
g dot w not on top of p v. Uh, sorry, I um, I under uh, I overestimate my homo energies, and basically, this is a sliding line, and somewhere in the middle there's a sweet spot, basically around 50 percent exact exchange, and this is what is in this b h l y p functional. So that is the cheapest, fastest way to get to the best results with GW. Another interesting thing is that if I start to include some sort of a self-consistency, um, self and this is self-consistency in G keeping W at the champ W, I see that this functional dependence shrinks, right? So if I do this on top of Hartree Fock, G not W not gives me that, bit of self-consistency pushes me towards the center. And the same goes for Hartree Fock. Uh, PB is a starting point, and I push again to the center if I do a bit of self-consistency. Now, finally, I already told you there's like a, a zoo of different ways of doing self-consistency. We have quasi-particle self-consistency, both G and W self-consistent, but we stay in the quasi-particle picture, quasi-particle orbitals, quasi-particle energies. We underestimate the homo energies a bit. Then there's different ways of only doing self-consistency in, in G. We can do self-consistency only in the energies. We keep the orbitals at the cone sham level. Um, this was our G not W not on top of uh, BH lib. And self-consistency, full self-consistency uh, starts to overestimate a bit. So again, if you want, really want the, have the answer, what is the cheapest, fastest way, at least for finite systems, start with quite a bit of exact exchange. So this is basically what happens in the rest of the series, a lot of other systems, a lot of other approaches for calculating um, homo energies and homo energies are also now using this data set. So now that we have the, um, the precision and accuracy and the um, reproducibility on the control, we can actually see whether it is actually possible to go to an automatic GW, right? So in this entire lecture series this week, you will be learning how to do a single GW calculation. And after the end of the week, you will appreciate the amount of knowledge you need and the amount of understanding about the theory you need to actually get the right numbers out. So the next challenge is, can we make this in such a way that I just provide some, some scripting and some fancy algorithms, and I give it a structure, I push the button, and I get converged GW results, right? So wrap all the information that you're learning here today in, and this entire week into like a machinery to do this automatic. And when I do automatic, I really mean start from a structure without any further human intervention. Maybe I decide what precision I want, would be a good thing. And what accuracy to get to converged GW results. And the advantage of this is that I don't need to spend all the time manually babysitting these calculations. I can do a screening for new compounds because the time that we would do one calculation, even one GW calculation, write a paper, new paper, this time is basically running out, right? So nowadays we learn screenings, try to find trends on a lot of materials, and also with GW, we need to do more automatic, we do more systems. So we can build databases, we collect data on a higher, higher level, and we can get um, more fundamental understanding. The other advantage here is that we get more uniform results. If I let the computer do all the convergence testing, I cannot go into the point where I say, ah, well, my, my computer resources are running out a little bit, so I will call this converged. Or I'm hitting the value that I want to see, so let's call this converged, right? There's a lot of papers out there that kind of, this is the converged result because my computer could not do heavier calculation than this. And finally, there's also no human bias, right? That's basically linked a little bit with this. So what is the problem with high throughput GW? So, first problem is pseudopotentials. Get to that in the next slide. Then, 
in general, a GW calculation is a four-step calculation. You have to do a ground state calculation, then you have to calculate all these MC states in a, in a non-self-consistent calculation, then you have to calculate the screening, and finally you calculate the GW. And if you want to do optical, you have to do a BZ afterwards. So if you make an automatic scheme, you need all of these steps to be connected properly in the different calculations that you're going to run on your cluster. Scaling is worse than in DFT, right? So, the amount of computer resources that I need for a larger system grows much faster than with DFT. That's also a problem. So I need to put some kind of heuristics in to guess, given the size of my system, how heavy is my calculation going to be. And this actually also means that there is, with this also increased amount of convergence parameters, there's no safe set of parameters. What do I mean by that? I mean, if I do a high throughput calculation for solids with DFT and I restrict myself to 100 atoms, I can just say, well, I know my pseudo potential, so I'll put an energy cutoff of 600 electron volts. It will be fine for everything. I get controversial results anywhere, everywhere. I can say, if I know it's a semiconductor, I put uh, so many K points per reciprocal atom, and that will be good enough. If it will be a bit overconverged, who cares? And for all these parameters, I can just build a list, do a few tests, and I know it, it's right. If I try to do the same thing for a GW, I'll put parameters in that give me converged results, but no calculation will ever finish because it's too heavy. And the other way, I can put computational parameters in that I know my calculation will finish, but I will have no converged results for any system. Right? So that's, that's another very big challenge for, for GW. So, convergence problem. This is the gap at gamma of boron nitride if I vary two parameters. So, I convert, uh, vary the number of empty states I take into the construction of the cell's energy, and I vary the energy cutoff I use in the expansion of the, um, of the screening and of the response function and, and, uh, and the cell's energy. So, now you see maybe what's the danger here, right? Would I decide, you know what, I will do my bands convergence at the low cutoff, I would find this curve, and I would say, oh, perfect. 100 is good, I will stay here. Well, maybe 50 is already good. And then I do the same trick on the other side. I will take like, a low number of bands, put it at 50, and then I do this convergence, get this line, oh, it's perfect, so 50 is good enough. And also, 100 for my cutoff is good enough, right? But you see already, these two parameters are not decoupled. So that's something to take into care. So I cannot do these individual convergence studies. I need to do them coupled. Then there is these computational resources. So the scaling. Scaling is not only in amount of flops I have to do, it's also about the amount of memory that I have to do. So if I do this convergence study for one of my systems, see that like most of the calculations finish within uh, with only like three gigabytes of memory, but I also need 14 gigabytes for a few of them. So if I would take a fixed set of computational parameters, like computer parameters, I would need to put all of them on 14 gigabytes, and I would be wasting an enormous amount of resources because these would all finish already very easily, right? So I need a system that actually takes care of this. If my calculation crashes because it ran out of memory, I need to increase the amount of memory. So that's something we implemented in, uh, in the Abinit Abipi framework that actually works. Then there's a the pseudo problem. Why well, it's a pseudo potential problem, right? Um, and this is just one of the nastiest kind of, of examples that I could find. This is, this is uh, gold chloride, a bit of an idiotic material, but, but let's, let's have a look at it for, for sure. So we know, like, we have this same convergence problem, right? And this is just taking a standard 19 electron gold to the potential. Now I unfreeze the 4F electrons. Not only does the energy shift significantly, the entire shape of this surface changes from something that goes up to something that goes down. So pseudo potentials. And this is still something, I mean, 
we have a set now where we think we can trust a lot, but this remains a very, very dangerous thing that you really have to check very carefully and understand what you're doing. Um, and all of this makes it, if we want to write like a, a very general, nice framework and do all this babysitting of these jobs, it's very complicated, right? And for, for DFTs calculations, this problem, so probably most of you are too young, right, or not? Do you know what, what, what this guy is or not? Yes, some people know, right? So if you, if you still remember, these guys are quite cute, right? But I don't remember anymore whether it was feeding or giving water, but if, if you compare babysitting these guys to babysitting DFT calculations, this is babysitting GW calculations, right? Now you can imagine this is for a single calculation, which we're doing this week. Now imagine what happens if we do high throughput GW, then it's about taking care of like an enormous bunch of these creatures, right? And some are bigger and some are smaller and some are more dangerous and some have eight legs and well, whatever, right? So, so that's what, what, what you're facing when you want to do high throughput calculation on, on GW. So for the pseudopotentials we worked, we worked quite hard. We now have sets of, of PBE, LDA, and PBE sole pseudopotentials where we also explicitly checked that the empty space is, is fine, right? If you make a pseudopotential at some point, there will be what is called ghost state, resonant states in empty space that should not be there. And if you hit them, no, it's fine, I, I, will, I will survive. Um, um, and I've done a lot of calculations also on, on solids with these. Uh, we still are currently in the process of trying to do the GW100 with these as well. But these are most of the time uh, fixed. So if you want certain potentials for, for your code, this is a good place to go. We have three different formats, which means that Abinit, Siesta, Quantum Espresso, CP2K, uh, ATK, a lot of codes can, can use these certain potentials, except for VASP. Um, so, just a few words on what we have actually did now to, to make this automation with for, for GW. We basically have built for for um, for Abinit a framework which we call Abipy, and basically this makes calculations into Pythonic objects. So they have all kinds of properties, all kinds of methods. They can read input files, write read input files, write input files, read output files, parse what has gone wrong to your specific calculation and you can easily make changes to the input parameters. So basically our entire flow will grow here. We first use this, this tool to generate a set of linked calculations. They're all connected to each other, saying this calculation needs the output from that one, and this can only run when this has done, and these kind of things. When all of that's done, we use the same framework to now take this object, which is the full simulation of a convergence study, and push it to the cluster. And there we basically have a framework that can deal with different schedulers, write the job script file, so that we can also make changes to it if we need more memory, for instance, run it, communicate with it, and push it back to a database when the, the calculation is done. So basically when this process is done, we push it to uh, a database where we store the results, and we also push the NetCDF data files that we get from Abinit into, uh, into the database. And that's, that's another very important part, right? Uh, Jumbo is doing this, uh, this now as well, right? Most of the old Ab initio codes, they were writing beautiful text files. Endless lines of code which sometimes were slightly different than, than other cases, but if you read them as a human being, you all never always understand what's there. But if you try to read these files with a computer, write a script to parse what happened to your calculation, what are the results, this is very nasty. So this is a very important development. So our initial codes need to write machine-readable formats now if we want to go to high throughput. So that's a very important development here. And if we have all of this, can use, again, a lot of the tools in Abipy to visualize and do interactive analysis and presentation of results in, in Jupyter Notebooks. So this is basically what this flow looks like. 
And what we do is we start off on a low K-point, low density K-point grid. I've tested this very well and it actually seems to work. For this, we do a convergence study for ground state parameters, basically cutoff parameter for the wave functions. And then we set up a grid of GW calculations like the one I showed you before, and we converge the both the number of bands and the energy cutoff for the response function and for the uh, Green's function to try to find values of these two that give us converged results. If we don't find them, we extend the grid and we loop again, right? If we have them, we go to the high k-point grid, we test the derivatives, basically we test whether in the point where we think we have convergence at the low k-point grid, we still have the same or a lower slope in the high density k-point grid. So we just calculate four more points at the high k-point grid. And then we do a lot of uh, post-processing. So this is basically what we do. We take not only one point here, we just extrapolate all of these to infinite energy cutoff, and then the results at infinite energy cutoff are extrapolated to infinite number of bands, and that's what we call the converged result. And then we find on this uh, surface the point for the number of bands in this cutoff that gives us a distance close enough to this converged result. So that's, to, to my opinion, the only way to do this really systematically and properly. And when we're talking about high throughput calculations, it needs to be systematically working for as many systems as possible, right? So it's not just one calculation. So it pays to spend a bit more, maybe do two more calculations. If that means that 10% more of your calculation to finish the flow, you will save much more time than if you try to be very strict and try to be as cheap as possible. More calculations will fail and you will have to redo them anyways. So this is just showing that doing it on a low k-point grid and on a high density k-point grid actually works. So this is for, for gold, the gap at gamma, very large gap, we go from ridiculously small k-point grid for a metal to something which starts to get close to something reasonable. And you basically see that the shape of this thing and even the, the width in energy that it spans stays pretty much the same. There's only a shift. It's basically coming from the exchange part of the cell energy. Okay, and all of this basically builds a lot on low-level tools that are already available in the PyMagin package and builds all of this on top of, uh, of ABIPI. Now what we can conclude after we did all of this, so I used this machinery that 80 odd something solids. First thing we see that there is, and we do this very simple calculation, just the Godby needs plasma pole model, uh, G not W not on top of PBE. I didn't dare to do anything more complicated. Concham right? um, and G not W not on PBE actually have a very good correlation, right? If you compare them to each other, there's a bit of an offset and there's a, there's a change. That's the first thing we observed. These are things that are known already but never shown for this many systems. Uh, now let's try to compare to experiment. And we already mentioned this a couple of times. GW gaps should not reproduce experiment. Right? GW gap is an electronic only gap. So even my exact electronic theory should not match experimental gaps. It should actually overestimate them. That's basically coming from zero-point randomization, spin-orbit effects, and finite temperature cor corrections. That's the, the three basic ones. It actually means that perfect agreement with experiment would lie somewhere between these two blue lines and not at the gray line of one-to-one -one correspondence. So we see... If we go beyond set of usual suspects, GW is not that super cool anymore as it's supposed to be when there was a hand-picked set of systems where GW was working well. Finally, we also did try to do a good analysis on, uh, on what is the error actually coming from where it is. Um, we see that there is basically, so in circles you see compounds that do not contain any transition metals 
and the square, square symbols are compounds that contain transition metals. See the correlation of the error with the experimental gap is different for those materials that are just main group elements. When there's transition metal elements, you have a different, different relation. It's also a situation, so the blue ones are the ones where the lightest element is very light. For instance, I have lithium or hydrogen in my system, and you see that tends to underestimate. This is coming from zero point randomization, mainly. While for heavy elements, it's not so clear, right? So if my symbols are very large, I have a very heavy element in my system, so I would have to include spin orbit corrections to make a good agreement. Finally, let's go to the overall big comparison again. We have Konshan and we have uh, the PBE, and we have uh, Godby needs G not W not top of PBE. But we also have a linear model, basically, when I remove the linear error from the Koncham results. So I look what is the correlation between Koncham and experiment, and I linearly correct for this. Fortunately, GW is still a bit better than just linearly correcting DFT, right? At least this level of GW. Right? So for solids, we have never gone, well, not in this study, we haven't gone beyond uh, a simple one-shot GW. So, concluding. Can we automate GW sufficiently to go high throughput? I think we're, we're getting there. It's much harder than doing it for DFT. We have to do a lot of things. This is pretty much similar to DFT. This is also there, but it's becoming more important because we have to have all these mechanisms in place to repair jobs that are broken. We have to detect these errors correctly we have to put all these algorithms, what to do when this happens in place. So, with that I would like to leave you with a little bit of, of commercial for a conference I'm organizing. If you are very interested in spectroscopy, there's also the uh, European Theoretical Spectroscopy Facility and the meeting in 2021 20, is going to take place at, uh, in our labs in Leuven. Um, probably have a tour on the new Atos second lab. And then one last slide. Um, if you're looking for a new position, you may want to have keep an eye on, on this site. In a couple of days, there will be something interesting there. Okay, so with that, I would like to leave you with this uh, slightly philosophical slide. And thank you very much for your very kind attention. Thank you.